This is Sky News in just a moment, the press preview. A first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. But first, our top stories. Boris Johnson has denied lying to the Queen over the suspension of Parliament, saying the claims are absolutely not true. The boss of one of Britain's biggest supermarkets, Co-op, has told Sky News there could be gaps on his shelves if the UK leaves the EU without a deal, just 24 hours after the release of the government's official worst-case scenario assessment. Five climate change activists have been arrested for planning to disrupt flights at Heathrow Airport by flying drones. Hello there, you're watching the Press Preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with The Observer's chief leader writer, Sonia Soda, and the writer, Benedict Spence. So let's see what's on some of those front pages now. The Times understands the DUP has said it would accept Northern Ireland abiding by some EU rules after Brexit as part of a new deal to replace the Irish backstop, which could hand Boris Johnson a lifeline. The front of The Guardian says John Burko will be prepared to rip up the parliamentary rulebook to stop Boris Johnson breaking the law on Brexit. The Telegraph has a word of a Labour plan to scrap VAT relief and charitable status for private schools. Leaked documents suggest such a move would generate over £1.6 billion. Pounds. While The Express goes with Boris Johnson warning that Labour will clobber hard-working people after a dossier laid bare 24 taxes planned by Jeremy Corbyn. The Metro reports on the death of an 11-month-old baby boy in a river in Greater Manchester. His father has been charged with murder. The Financial Times reports on a newly announced stimulus package put forward by the European Central Bank to encourage fiscal growth in the Eurozone. The Mirror carries an exclusive special report on the fires in the Amazon rainforest. According to official figures, the number of women who are married is at a record low. That's on the front of the mail. And Star says this weekend is set to be a scorcher in the UK. And tonight, we're joined by Sonia Soda and Benedict Spence. Good evening to you both. Thanks very much for being here. So let's start with the Times and a potential glimmer of hope for Boris Johnson coming from the DUP. Yes, so the big sticking point as to whether Boris Johnson is going to manage to negotiate the deal that he really says he wants with the EU or not is the existence of the Northern Ireland backstop in the existing withdrawal agreement that Theresa May negotiated. And Boris Johnson, ever since he's become Prime Minister and really a bit before, has said the backstop cannot exist. Um, this idea that, you know, uh, that the UK and Northern Ireland would sort of uh, have some regulatory alignment with the, uh, with the rest of the EU in order to avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland. Um, now, in recent days, there's been some kind of rumours around this idea that Boris Johnson might offer the EU uh, the idea of actually a Northern Ireland only backstop. What that would mean would be that you'd have to have customs checks in the Irish Sea. So Northern Ireland would sort of diverge a bit from the UK in terms of rules um, and would follow more closely EU rules. Something that the DUP had previously said. Some, totally exactly. Now, this is where we get onto this interesting time story. So that was never really a goer because the DUP, which uh, the Conservatives rely on for, uh, well, it used to be a working majority in Parliament, it is no longer, um, negative majority of 21, uh, but the DUP have been very important to the Conservatives in Parliament and they've always said, absolutely not. There cannot be anything resembling a border down the Irish Sea. Now, what's interesting is that this time story suggests that there may be a slight budging in the position. So they're saying, well, we could accept some customs checks in the Irish Sea, um, but the EU would have to give us something in exchange. And that's this idea that actually Northern Ireland wouldn't really have to comply with um, too many rules. Instead, there would be what the DUP term alternative arrangements. Well, we keep hearing about um, alternative which, Exactly. Right? And actually, there's no detail in this story whatsoever. So I think it's kind of the DUP probably want to appear like they're offering a bit of a, a you know, an, an, an olive branch here, that they might be prepared to budge. But I think if, if the EU looks at this, they'll look at this and they'll say, well, there's, there's nothing concrete about these alternative arrangements. Um, and I think it will be very, very difficult for Boris Johnson to cross something out of this. Yeah, I think that's the key thing, really, is that in this report, there is 
is no detail on what exactly it is we're talking about. Now, if you were to put money on something, you'd say probably agriculture, because Northern Ireland already diverges from the UK and is more closely aligned with the island of Ireland, the, the rest of the Republic of Ireland, sorry, than it is with the UK. But beyond that, well, then you're into more difficult territory. But it, this does also strike me as almost being a bit of sort of playing politics from the perspective of the DUP, because as you mentioned, for so long, they were these key sort of cornerstones in propping up Theresa May's majority. Well, now even with the DUP, the Prime Minister has no majority. And so with that goes a lot of the Democratic Unionist Party's leverage. Actually, it doesn't matter whether they support them or not. They're not going to get these things through in their current form. So there needs to be a bit of give and take, because otherwise, ultimately, if the UK does crash out or stays in, completely contrary to what it is that the DUP wants, they will get a great deal of the blame for being quite obstinate if it were to be put forward, say that there were alternative arrangement deals on the table and they were seen as the major stumbling block. You know, we've already gone through the whole process of having Theresa May go to the Commons multiple times and her deal be turned down, turned down because it was a little bit too hard line because the DUP weren't prepared to budge on lots of things. Well, you can just sort of sense who will get the blame in Northern Ireland then if things don't quite go to plan. So to me, this softening of their position seems to me to be them realising that their political usefulness is running out. Yeah, and, and this talk again of alternative arrangements mm. comes, as Boris Johnson says, he's confident that they can reach a deal uh, at the European summit. He might be before. the only person in that room who's confident and, about But Michelle Barnier is saying, well, we haven't heard anything. Yeah, absolutely. Michelle Barnier, is, it, it, there's been a very consistent message from the EU in recent weeks and months, which is if you want a renegotiation, if you want to reopen the withdrawal agreement, you know, we're not necessarily opposed to that, but it's up to Britain to bring alternatives to the Irish backstop and to put them on the table, and then we'll have a discussion about them. And I think what the EU and what EU officials find quite frustrating is that for months and months and months, British politicians have said, we don't want this backstop. Let's do something else instead. Let's find a way of doing checks that aren't at the border that use some form of magical technology that hasn't been invented yet. And I think the EU feel, well, this is a degree of just sort of creative magical thinking. Uh, you haven't put forward these proposals yet. And it's essentially because that technology does not yet exist. So that's why the EU want this insurance arrangement, which is a close to regulatory alignment, which means that you don't need a border. And it's very hard to see how that gets resolved, I think. And even with the DUP sort of giving some way um, on their position, it's hard to see how other aspects of the Conservative Party, the ERG, might go for regulatory alignment between Northern Ireland and the rest of Ireland. So I think, I think Benedict's absolutely right here, actually. I think so much of the noises that we've seen, both from Europe, from the UK government, from the DUP, are about blame shifting, about, you know, I think a lot of people think we're sort of heading for a no deal outcome if we are going to exit on the 31st. We know from these leaked government documents that we've seen in the last 24 hours that that could have some really damaging consequences for things like supply of food, supply of medical uh, supplies. And so people are just trying to line themselves up so they avoid the blame and say, well, actually, it's more their fault than our fault. We tried to give way on this. In terms of that uh, Brexit date, October the 31st, uh, the Telegraph, uh, their story saying that Boris Johnson's being urged by cabinet allies to apply for an extension, something he said rather be dead in a ditch than do. Well, uh, it must be said, I never thought that the October 31st deadline was in any way realistic. I think it was entirely about framing a narrative. I think actually the government knew full well that they wouldn't be able to get any sort of a Brexit deal and probably not even a hard Brexit done by then. The idea was to tempt opponents in Parliament to essentially form some sort of alliance so that Boris Johnson could go to the country and say, well, look, I can't get this deal through because Parliament is preventing me to try to frame this narrative of Parliament versus the people. I think that what they weren't counting on was the Labour mm. Party not taking the bait because they've been saying for years now, we want an election, we're on a permanent election footing. I think that they weren't expecting them to go, yeah, actually, no, we're not going to do that right now. I think they were fully expecting them to go, yes, absolutely, let's get behind it. I think that the Labour Party called their bluff. And again, I think a lot of this now, um, we hear this talk of maybe the DUP moving, maybe inviting the 21 uh, deselected MPs back into the party. 
There is now the suggestion that because the government isn't going to get what it wants, it has to start negotiating, it has to come up with a deal that it hasn't actually given any thought to before, simply because it needs to be seen to be doing something, because it needs a general election. Now, without any movement at all, the Labour Party won't back a general election, neither will any of the other parties, so it now needs to give them some sort of a deal, some sort of a reason to back a, hilariously, a vote of no confidence in the government in order to get things moving. Unless that happens, well, we're just sort of stuck in a permanent state of limbo with a government that is in office but not in power. John Burko, though, on the front of The mm. Guardian saying, well, we'll rip up the parliamentary rule book to ensure that the Prime Minister cannot take Britain. Absolutely. And um, John Burkow, he's, he's already said he's resigning. He's a Speaker of the House of Commons, already said that he's resigning at the end of October. So he doesn't have long left in post. He's been incredibly <coughs> important in this Brexit debate, though, because... Many, controversial. Controversial. Lots of people think he's been quite an interventionist speaker. I personally think he's been standing up for the rights of Parliament. So it's very clear that Parliament is against a no-deal outcome. Boris Johnson seems gung-ho on delivering Brexit, even if it's a no-deal outcome, even if Parliament say they don't want that to happen. And John Burkow has really been standing up for MPs um, in this matter and kind of sort of taking some procedural uh, interesting decisions, I would say, that go against convention, but which mean that MPs, he's really put MPs in control. And he's suggesting, he's given this big speech today, which The Guardian have reported on the front page. He's essentially saying, um, if, if Johnson goes further, if you know, he's, Boris Johnson has now got himself into this pickle, essentially, where he said, it's going to be Brexit, do or die on the 31st of October. Parliament has legislated to say, if you don't get a deal by mid-October, you're going to have to go and ask for an extension. And so now he's in this position, and, and, and MPs aren't granting him a general election. So he's in this position where he has to decide, is he going to do what Parliament has mandated him to do if he can't get a deal? And um, there have been hints from the government, quite shockingly, I think, that this is a prime minister who might consider breaking the law. Um, now, there are all sorts of efforts going on in the courts to ensure that that doesn't happen. But this is really John Burkow, speaker for you know another six weeks or so, um, saying, we've got a bit of time. If Johnson um, decides to try and break the law, I will do everything in my power as Speaker to stop him from doing that. I found a word from you on this. I'd say it's, it's curious. I think John Burko is doing a lot of things that are sort of morally upstanding, but he is exactly the worst person that you could possibly want to do them because he's quite so partisan. I think a lot of the bad feeling against him is because he, as an individual, regardless of what his politics are, the way he carries himself and the language that he uses and the double standards that he employs doesn't come across especially well. Now, you know, just take... Brexit sort of, you know, take the his row with the Tory party out of the equation. Let's actually look at more broadly what Brexit is, because Brexit is not just a vote against Brussels. I know lots of people like to frame it that way, but it's not. It is as much a vote against Westminster as it is against Brussels. The problem is when you have a particularly vociferous Speaker of the House of Commons sort of behaving in the manner that he is and being quite open about the fact that he, A, doesn't like Brexit and will do whatever he can to try to stop it, well, that doesn't play very well with the people that you kind of need to win over, which is the public. If you want to try to sell this idea to the public that Brexit is not a great idea and that parliamentarians do have your best interests at heart, somebody like John Burkow is the exact wrong person to try to sell that message. And I do think that this long term, as much as I think a lot of what he's doing is right in upholding you know, the, the authority of parliament against uh, against you know, um, an, an executive that wants to just sort of smash a battering ram through it, I don't think he's done himself any favours in the grand scheme of things, certainly not with using language like additional pre procedural creativity. People will listen to that and go, so you're trying, you're, you're being sneaky is basically what you're think doing. Some people gonna go just very read well. it and think, what? What is he on What that? does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're going to take just a me. short break now. <laughs> Coming up, we can promise you a Brexit-free zone. Not wedded to the idea, why more women are saying, I don't, to marriage, that and more, after the break.
Welcome back. You're watching the press preview with me now, Sonia Soda and Benedict Spence. I promised a Brexit-free zone, but it's not a politics-free <laughs> zone. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn's tax raid on private schools on the front of the Telegraph. That's gearing up for an election. Oh, we are definitely gearing up for an election. There's been lots of announcements on both sides. This one, the Telegraph is splashed with, I suspect, because um, they think their readers may be a bit worried about this particular proposal for VAT on private school fees. Uh, might hit parents quite hard who send their kids to private schools. But it's not actually, I think, that controversial of policy. It was in the last Labour manifesto. Uh, one Michael Gove uh, did actually propose this himself a few years ago. And the fact is that tax breaks are for charities and charitable status is for charities that create social good in the world. Private schools actually exist to cream off children from more affluent backgrounds, take them out of the scale, estate school system. They, they sort of replicate privilege. They certainly don't create social good. Um, if you look at some of the statistics, children from private schools are 12 times more likely to get access to the top professions. I'm sorry, but children from private schools are definitely not 12 times as good as, as kids from state schools. So it just really shows you how much privilege uh, there is in the system. So go Labour is what I say. Better do some raised eyebrows. Yeah, well, no, Labor. absolutely. I agree. There's no way on earth I'd be here if I hadn't been to a public school. So uh, I can completely agree with that. No, I think that this, uh, it is electioneering and I just think it's quite tired. Obviously, I was going to say that, but we always have people coming out and bashing uh, private schools when we come to the sort of election time. I mean, for a well, start, it, it's, it's not it's going to raise... To Michael, the policy is Michael. not going to raise... He raised it and it did not go any further than that. And there's a reason why it didn't go any further than that. It's not going to raise 1.6 billion. That's the first thing we need to say. And I also think, ultimately, bashing private schools, I understand why, because they are elitist. And don't get me wrong, I'm not especially on board with that. I think the problem is more a problem of the state system, which is why these schools exist in the first place. What we so should I do, and I'm going to go on a full sort of regressive policy and say, actually, we need more grammar schools, is ultimately what I think we need. We need a much better system of making sure that people who are ne less well off in society have a better crack of the whip at better schools. The problem with that is that all the evidence suggests that grammar schools don't improve overall results. They don't particularly That's improve. That's not true it at all. It is true. It's it is true. true. I know the education evidence. No, it's not they true don't at all. And I can give you the, they don't, I can they give you they the evidence rather than just... They don't improve the results of, of more able children from disadvantaged backgrounds. What they do is they depress the results of children in the middle of the attainment uh, distribution and less able kids. The best performing school systems in the, in the world are those that are more equitable, that don't do selection of children at age 11. It's bad for children it's to quite select simple. at age 11. Not true. You can, look at, you true. can look at it the rates true. of people There's from underprivileged backgrounds. When this country had a grammar school system nationwide, the percentage of lower income background children at universities in this country is much higher than it currently is. Tiny, tiny proportions of poor children go to grammar schools because grammar schools overwhelmingly... Overwhelming well, currently, yes, because they only happen kids. in a few key areas of this country, but actually in those areas no, of this country, it's because they there's a higher level of more affluent kids. <laughs> Before we end up in complete disagreement <laughs> between you, I'm going to move on to the You had to disagree on something. Yeah, I did. Really well really well. You did. Let's move on to the union of marriage. This is, I mean, this is just such typical Daily Mail reporting, which is why I think we picked this story. First of all, they blame it all on women, and then you find out that the, the reason why the slightly fewer women are married than men is because men die earlier than women, so you've got more women who are widowed. See, I thought so it's it was because absolute... women were marrying two at a time. Maybe I thought female empowerment had really gone well. And now but it's an absolutely bonkers. So, so the Daily Mail uh, is basically blaming falling marriage rates on women uh, because there were more women who are widowed, which is absolutely bonkers. And it's, you know, saying that women are more likely to go to higher education these days. So they uh, are less likely to settle down. So it's just a really traditionally conservative narrative. These women, I mean, God, they're so beyond their station. They want to go to university. They're not interested in marriage. That's why marriage rates are going down in this country. Uh, and I just think it's a, it's a really, really backwards uh, take. Uh, <laughs> female empowerment. Meghan Markle, the Duchess of Sussex. That was a theme of her event today. Well, her some women are getting from, married, evidently. They, they certainly are, um, with great fanfare. Um, she returned from maternity leave today mm -hmm. to launch a fashion line. What's it all about, Benedict? I don't know what the fashion line is about. I just simply know what I know about Meghan Markle and uh, her husband, which is that they are never going to be king and queen. And I don't think that they should, therefore should be getting uh, money from the taxpayer to live their lives. I think we hear a lot of, I think we hear a lot of quite oh, conflicting man. stories about 
specifically, it's always aimed Shall at. We get to this it's story? always aimed at Meghan Markle. You know, there's all of the coverage. I mean, you know, we had earlier on Sky. Uh, Sky, there was coverage of um, the Duke of Sussex, but most of the media coverage is always about the Duchess of Sussex, and there are conflicting reasons as to why. Some people say it's because the press is particularly biased against her, for whatever reason. Other people say it's because she's not a very nice individual. Ultimately, I think she's just a Hollywood star. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I just don't just think. That, that, okay. I just don't think that Come she on, or she's... her husband are relevant she's... to the constitutional future of this country. Therefore, uh, I just no, don't think look, we should fund them. But, but this is not what this is about. She's launched a capsule collection, uh, five new items of clothing, sales go to charity. They support women who are out of work. It's, it's quite hard to disagree with that, isn't it, Sonia? Benedict, he certainly can. Thank you very much <laughs> indeed. Coming up next on Sky News at 11. Absolutely no lies, says Boris Johnson.